Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lori Getch. I'm Dean of Libraries. Most of you know that, but there, we have a few guests in the room who may not. Um, welcome you to our uh, Open Access Week activities. I'm very pleased to have the honor of introducing our speaker this afternoon, and I will tell you a little bit about him. Um, our speaker is Dr. Philip E. Bourne. Dr. Bourne is a professor of pharmacology at the Skagg School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at UC San Diego. He is also the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Industrial Alliances, Associate Director of the Protein Data Bank, and co-founder and founding editor-in-chief of the open access journal PLOS Computational Biology. He is a past president of the International Society for Computational Biology and an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the International Society for Computational Biology, and the American Medical Informatics Association. Dr. Bourne is an advocate for open access, and his research and professional interests focus on biological and educational outcomes derived from computational and scholarly communications. His areas of interest include algorithms, test, mi test mining, text mining, I think this is supposed to say, uh, machine learning, uh, meta languages, biological databases, and visualization applied to a uh, multiplicity of problems, including drug discovery, evolution, and cell signaling. As an open access advocate, Dr. Bourne is committed to furthering the free dissemination of science through new models of publishing and better integration and subsequent <coughs> dissemination of data and results. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Philip Bourne to Kansas State University. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me here. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's interesting, we were just having a little discussion, in fact, that, that I look at the gender balance in the room, it's, uh, it's not actually a balance, uh, <laughs> which is completely the opposite of when I gave a talk to the editors of the American Chemical Society, where the balance was the other way around. Uh, they treated me a lot worse than I know you will, so uh, I can see that you're as friendly, definitely a friendly audience already. So let me just try and tell you a few of the things that have sort of I've been thinking about for some time, as many other people have. And I was asked to put more of an emphasis on uh, data um, and open data and what the imp uh, implications are. And I'm primarily uh, just a faculty member who's interested in, in pushing this. So it's, you know, it, that's my perspective. And my thing is not working anymore. It was before. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, actually, I can't seem to change the slides at all. I could just talk about this one slide. Uh, let me just, sorry, let me just restart this. That is very strange. Uh, well, there are other ways of doing this which don't seem, whoops, we don't want to look at my email, sorry. We, you have enough of your own. You don't need any of mine. Um, so let me just tell you a, a little about my perspective. So as I as already was made clear, I work in the, in the biosciences. And it's really that perspective I bring to this. I, I run a couple of major databases, and we distribute uh, a lot of information. Uh, we estimate a quarter of the, nat uh, the National Library of Science uh, or not, yes, the, Natural Li the National Library of Science to uh, investigators every month. And uh, based on that, I, you know, I have a certain perspective around data. Uh, and I, now, what's in, what's in this new role I have is this uh, looking at innovation within our institution, I've started to think more about what the institution itself should, and each of our own institutions should be doing around data. If, if this is the best we can do, that's fine. We can just use this. So, um, in all of this, although I'm a big advocate for open access, I always use uh, a caveat associated with that, and that is the notion that there must be a business model. Uh, I don't, you can't have sustainability without a business model. And as you know, and there was a lot of questions about open access and whether that business model would be sustained um, when things first started off. But that's clearly, uh, it is sustainable, there's no question about that. Uh, organizations like the Public Library of Science, which I'm involved with, 
uh, have already proven that. I also acknowledge that every discipline is different. And in fact, just because something works well, say, in the biosciences, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work uh, in other places. But what is clear, in my mind at least, is that my general opinion of open access is it's not a question of if we're going to have open access. We already have it. It's a question of you know, when is it going to be and how is it going to be the predominant form uh, of scholarship. And those are still open questions, but it's, it's clear. If you talk to the leading editors of the major closed access publications, I think they will each agree that at some point there will be models that provide at least an open access option if they don't already. So we're, we're getting there, so the momentum is increased, increasing. Uh, I think where, it's, where we need to have much more effort and where things will really accelerate is when we use that open access content in ways that actually increase our understanding and increase our knowledge base. I don't think we're doing that at the moment. Most of what we do with open access content is to just have access to it in a broader spectrum and to a, a larger group of people. But we also have, with that content, the ability to use that content. I don't just necessarily mean in text mining, that, although that's part of it, but really knowledge discovery from the corpus. And developing ways of doing that are still fairly undeveloped. But we are, as we, our politicians keep telling us, in uh, a, you know, a knowledge-based economy now. And so as that tends to grow, I think more and more attention is going to come from extracting data from this available corpus. And that's sort of what my theme is going to be. So let me cast that theme. I learned at lunch that uh, you're working on an open access policy. The University of California system is also working on an open access policy. And that, just to say, uh, to put that debate in its current perspective, let me just you know, indicate where we are. Um, what we're moving towards, in our case, is what from an opt-in policy to an opt-out policy. So right now, you choose as a faculty member or as a, a scholar to opt in to open access publishing. What many places, Harvard, Stanford, and so on have done, is essentially move to an opt-out policy where you, you need to make your work open access, or, uh, or but you can opt out if you so choose. And already I've heard, you know, I've just sort of summarized here some of the arguments that uh, are familiar to anyone who's involved with open access, because they keep reoccurring. And that, of course, is things like the cost, if you look at the negatives for it, is the cost of some disciplines. If you don't have grant money and you have to pay to publish, where's that money going to come from? It's a legitimate concern, and, and therefore each uh, discipline needs to approach this dif differently. The impacts of society on societies, which depend, many of whom depend a lot on the revenues from journals, what happens to that? So these are, these are well-trodden arguments that um, are important, and we're currently debating all of this. The notion of journal quality. There is, you know, there's this perception that if you publish in an open access journal, the quality is not there. Well, that's, you know, to some extent has been true because the major, you know, say if you say in the biosciences with journals like Science and Nature, there hasn't been an open access equivalent to those. That's now changing. eLife is about to start publishing, and that uh, is, intends to be on a par with science and nature, as an example. And then there's this notion of being, you know, big brother and being told what to do and so forth. Uh, on the for side, of course, I think most people would agree that in a public university, that, you know, whatever you do, in a sense, should be made public. <laughs> uh, it's as simple as that, and you could you can cast it in many different ways. The, but what I've, what I've been trying to push now to help this movement move forward is the idea that there's institutional perspective and value in this that we haven't even begun to uh, address yet. And I'll give you an example or two of that uh, in the end. But really, we haven't really identified. If we, have, if we make our research data, as an example, and our research knowledge open, we can do things with it uh, as an institution as well as um, a, in a more global perspective that hasn't been otherwise possible. And that, I think, is an example of where open access uh, could really be made to take off. And I'll say a bit more about that as we go along. 
So, oh dear, now I, all right, this is going to be rather awkward. So why is all this so important to me? Well, here's an example that's just taken from our own work. Um, this is from this database that we maintain called the Protein Data Bank. Now, on the top right-hand corner there is a graph that just shows the number of H1N1 cases in the United States maintained by the CDC over time. And you can see that it grew quite quickly, then it flattened off. Correspondingly, our access to two items of data, it doesn't really matter what they are, in a public repository in response to this crisis. And there is a correlation between how this data was accessed and the crisis itself. So what it says is that in a time of crisis, this data becomes very important and is, is accessed correspondingly. So it's very important that that data be available. At the same time, the Public Library of Science created a portal uh, plus current in influenza. And that was a place to publish information about the epidemic very quickly with minimal review so the information could be put out there, not just papers but also data and other things. There was a huge spike of activity around this portal during the epidemic. When, of course, that died off, then usage of that dropped back to very low levels. And partly because that has to do with the reward system. There was a, you know, there's no reward for putting things into that kind of archive when you can publish it, even though it might take a year before it appears. But the crisis shows that people were prepared to do you know, other things. So these are just sort of examples of uh, you know, signs of that we could have the potential at least to change. Uh, so it proves, too, that open science just accelerates the process. There's no question there was an acceleration of discovery by virtue of things like the PLOS Currents portal uh, and access to the open data. In the sort of mode of we're in with presidential debates and everything, what happens almost invariably is you start off with a general point and then you, s you immediately go in to say, well, I met so-and-so uh, while I was having coffee at so-and-so. And they told me, and of course, to drive home the point. So why should I be any different? So I'm just going to tell you a couple of stories about people I met that sort of drive home the whole value uh, of open access and open, and open data in particular. So this is someone called Josh Summers. I mean, just of interest, how many people know this story? All right, good. So, so, so he was a, a freshman at Duke in engineering. And he started getting these serious headaches and he went and he had a full workup, and he discovered, he was told, that he had uh, Cordoma's disease. And he's lying there in the recovery uh, after all these tests, using the wireless in the hospital, and he's, he's Googling this, and he's use, looking at ab abstracts in PubMed, but he can't, and he realizes this is a very serious uh, situation, but he can't actually get into the details of these studies to find out more about his condition. This is just a, you know, a, a common situation. What he does discover is the prognosis is not good. And in fact, he has, of the order at best, seven years to live. So, you know, if that had been me, I probably would have started partying heavily and, and kept going. What he did was to do something quite remarkable, which with, with his mother, first of all, he went into the lab. Uh, fortuitously, the only NIH-funded uh, Cordoma researcher in the US at the time was also at Duke University. So he stopped doing engineering and he went and volunteered in this person's lab. And that's a picture of him in the lab there. And at the same time, he and his mother formed a Cordoma Foundation. And this is uh, one of the earlier meetings that they had. And you know, they got a lot of sponsorship and a lot of support for this. But what he noticed in the lab was actually quite appalling is that, and I can't really show some of this stuff now, but because uh, it's all animated, but in fact, let me just go to this. So what he found was that people, even in one lab, didn't communicate and share information uh, quite in the way they should. And that sharing between labs was, was even more problematic, both in terms of data uh, and in terms of uh, knowledge. It was all about getting those publications, which takes a long time. If you only have seven years to live, 
a, a year to, to publication before someone else can even start looking at what your findings are is pretty devastating. So, you know, he became part of a movement which is called Sage Bio Networks, where the idea is to take this kind of model and turn it into this kind of model using the so-called power of the commons. So it's actually creating a collection of information around disease modeling that's accessible to everybody all the time and accessible more or less immediately. It, it begins to change the way, uh, potentially, the way science works. It's almost like a commons becomes the equivalent in physics of the Hadron Collider. So where you have all these scientists aggregating around, in that case, a large piece of hardware, here you have a lot of scientists aggregating around what's actually a virtual space that's full of data and tools and people's commentary uh, about a treatment of a disease. And these commons are starting to really take off. And that's important because what he shows year after year is he'll show the meaning of the Chordoma Foundation and then what he shows in these circles are the people who've died since the meeting was held last year. So, you know, we're talking about a, a disease that affects particularly long, young children. So, you know, the point is we need to do, we need to accelerate the process for people like Josh. So, in the same vein, I'm now moving to a different coffee shop and I'm going to tell you another story I heard from a, a voter. Um, and this is, this is the story of Meredith. And this is another example why, frankly, why I'm standing here. So I, I actually was, as the editor-in-chief of this journal, about once a week, someone will send me a paper uh, directly to the journal, uh, directly to me by email, thinking they're going to get a, a, you know, an easy ride through the review process. Normally, I send it directly to the journal office. office. This time, for reasons become apparent, I decided uh, to uh, look at it myself. I, it was in pandemic modeling. I'm not an expert in pandemic modeling, but I could see that there was something special about this, both in the way the work had been done by a single author and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and by the, the outcome. So I sent it to Simon Levine, who's at Princeton and a Kyoto Prize winner. He looked at this and he said, Phil, this is really you know, a special piece of work. So I actually advised her to send it to science to get be reviewed where it was reviewed. In the end, they didn't publish it, but it, it, it will appear in somewhere like PNAS very shortly. It's a very good piece of work. So what's so special about this? I subsequently, t after I met with her because she lived in San Diego. And after I met with her, I invited her to come and give a lecture at UCSD, which she did. And I'm sitting there in listening to her fend these questions from you know, this, these high-powered academics. And I'm just marveling at it. And why am I marveling at it? Because she's 15 years old and she's a senior at La Jolla High School. This started as um, uh, a project, in, you know, a, a science fair project. She then went and started looking at this seriously. She wrote to Wolfram and got a copy of R, which is a, a, a package, or actually, sorry, Mathematica, a package for um, uh, an analysis. She wrote to the original authors because the data wasn't online anywhere. She had to get the data from the authors. She wrote to the supercomputer center in San Diego and she got you know, thousands of hours of computation time. And she did this thing all on her own. And it, you know, I'm, it's, just, it's just a remarkable story. She's now at Stanford. She's 16 now. She can actually drive. When she, when she, <laughs> first, when she first came, her father had to bring her to the lab because she had no way of getting there. So what, is, what does all this tell us? I think it tells us that openness is... You know, there are, I mean, obviously, she's an extreme end of the, the spectrum. I have a daughter, and I'm an old guy, but I have a daughter the same age, and my daughter's so sick of hearing this story. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, but, so it's an odd case, but clearly what I see in the students that I, I see every year, which are primarily graduate, but some undergraduates now, is that they are, they are pheno some of them are phenomenal. And they are, they are part of this Wikipedia, Khan Academy, whatever you want to say, YouTube generation, that they know no bounds. And I, I really believe that these kinds, you know, I say underexploited. I mean, I have two undergraduates in my lab right now that are doing work as good as some of my graduate students. And one of them, actually, I say is at this postdoc level. So, you know, and I think they're doing it because they have all of this access. So it's another, it's another example of how 
and where we can exploit these assets. And we need to tell these stories and really sort of get this to be uh, you know, more common. So let's explore the notion of what we might, you know, if expanding on this with an emphasis on data and where, where we're going with data. I mean, one of the problems, and again, I'm referring mainly to the biosciences, and I, is that we have these things coalesced into silos. So the majority of the knowledge is effectively in the literature, and the majority of the data from which that knowledge is derived is effectively uh, in, uh, da in, in databases, at least the digital parts of it. And, but they're starting to coalesce in some ways. And, they're, you know, they're, but they're not fully coalesced. And the reasons are partly technical and partly cultural, in my opinion. So the supplemental information in papers has exploded over the last year, mainly because there's all this extra data in there. Data journals themselves are emerging. I'm involved with a, an effort, for example, with the Faculty of 1000, uh, where they're actually putting together data journals. So it's actually publishing data sets. Why would you publish data sets? Because that's where you get the credit. You know, we're stuck in this system where you only get credit for, for, for publishing papers. So what do you do? You write a paper about a data set, which of course has no value in of itself. It just gives you a metric in the system. I have a paper about the PDB database, which I think is the third or fourth most cited paper in all of biology. And what's ironic about it is no one has ever read it. There's absolutely no reason to read it because it's just a reference to a database that everybody uses. But the only way we get credit for doing it is, is to write a paper, a useless paper, about the database. The system is completely wacky. And when I tell we have, and I'm sure you have the same system here, but maybe with a different name, Committee on Academic Promotions, we have a UC called CAP. You start telling people, you know, I try to talk to CAP about this, that it's just breaking that system is very hard. But it has to start with the people who are being evaluated, telling the people who are evaluating them how they should be evaluated. And that's pretty hard if you don't have tenure yet. I mean, I'll say anything, I don't care then. The chances of me getting kicked out are pretty small. Well, they were until today, who knows? <laughs> uh, but, you know, anyway, I'm digressing. So there's the issue of reward. But what we are seeing is a level of coalescence and the software becoming available. But at the same time, the databases are becoming more like journals. They call themselves knowledge bases. And they, they try and aggregate more information about that data. <coughs> you can do science on the fly in these resources. You can run applications and programs from these resources. And, you know, there are people who dedicate their careers to making these resources very valuable, so-called, in this field, so-called biocurators. They, to me, are some of the unsung heroes uh, of the kind of science that I do anyway. But all of this leads to say that things really need to change. Where does this take us? Really, the, the notion of the whole, in principle, not in reward, but in principle, a paper is an artifact of a previous era. It's not the logical end product of e-science. Of e Work is omitted. The, you know, have you ever tried to use supplemental information in a paper? You, know, you can do it if you look at it by hand, but you want, you, what you really want is you want a computer program to go and pull this information in from multiple different papers and make some aggregated conclusion. Good luck. The visualization that you can do on things in a paper is pretty limited. There's nothing wrong with a paper, don't get me wrong. But as you'll see in a second, it's really just one way of looking at it. Uh, you know, the in you can't interact with a paper. And that's really how we get to the next step of knowledge, is by interacting with what we have already. And there are lots of other aspects, like the use of rich media, which um, you know, we haven't used very effectively at this time. <coughs> so that's really where we stand on the paper side. What about the data side? Well, we now have data sharing policies. And many of you know about these because you either are subject to them or you're, you're responsible for telling faculty who haven't the faintest idea what they are, what they need to do with these. And so we all write these grants now with data sharing policies, which conform to these wonderful notions. But I almost guarantee, myself included, that anyone who's writing one of these things doesn't even conform to their own policy. 
they try to, but it, for reasons, some technical, some cultural, uh, it, it's very hard to do. But don't worry, no one's really checking. Um, you know, the NSF don't know how to deal with it either, or the NIH for that matter. Um, but it, it does beg the question, it does take us one step forward. At least there's some level of awareness now of the importance of this data. So, and the, the awareness is growing because big data is taking off. There was the, uh, the Office of Science and Technology the, uh, the President uh, of the White House put $200 million into big data projects. That's now trickled down, and we're seeing a variety of projects from the NSF, the NIH, around the notion of big data. So there's more attention being paid to this. This is just, I really like this, and I put it in there. So even the private foundations. So I've been working with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, where they've been trying to figure out how they can promote the idea of the value of data to science in ways that it's not uh, currently being done. We had a think tank meeting uh, at uh, their uh, offices in Palo Alto, and they brought in this sort of conceptual cartoonist, which I really like. So while you're debating around the room and discussing this, this is actually being captured uh, in a single wall of uh, outcomes associated with that. And they then use this, this final summary to, in this case, it was saying, where are we going to be? With, where do we need to be with data in the year 2021? Uh, as the, the basis for their funding in this area in the coming years. And I think what you're going to see is this idea of trying to break this reward system, is to reward those people who manage and produce data and use data, uh, not from the publication point of view, but with money to continue to do and develop what they're doing. So I think you're going to see some interesting developments from all agencies. So those, you've got to add all these other things into the mix when you start worrying about data. It's not just big data. You've got all these issues associated with reproducibility, maintainability, usability, and reward we've already uh, touched upon. You know, re reproducibility is undoubtedly a myth. We call it a pillar of science. It's not that something is not reproducible, in my opinion. It's just the effort that needs to go into that reproducibility is just huge. And even when you do it yourself, I took a paper that we published about a year ago with four authors from my lab. Two of the authors had already left the lab. And what we used was a workflow system to try and recreate that work so the next generation of students coming in could actually repeat those experiments and build new experiments uh, in, in a way that was quite uh, efficient. Well, guess what? We couldn't actually, I could not do it. I couldn't do it myself anyway, because I don't actually do anything. But even the one person left in the lab who knew you know, the ins and outs of the work, all the scripts we'd done, all the bits and pieces, realized that without the help of the other two authors who'd left the lab, we couldn't reproduce it. And you know, I, I'm, I'm being honest about this, but you know, I think that, that is, I would argue, is in many cases the uh, norm and not the exception. Maintainability is something we're not even becoming to grips with. You know, DNA data alone, forget about everything else, is doubling of the order every five months. It is way ahead of the Moore's curve law, which says you, know, you can continue to, at the same cost, maintain this increasing amount of data. It's just not going to happen. No one seems to be pressing up to the idea that we're really going to have to decide what data to throw away and how we throw away it how we, we go about throwing away, and how we choose what to throw away. Usability I'll come back to in a minute, but you know, using data in different forms and different forums is not straightforward. And then there, there is no tenure for just publishing data. So, but dreams do emerge. And here's my dream, all encapsulated in one slide. Uh, and I've shown this so many times, I think it's going to be on my tombstone. Um, but I just want to use it as an illustration for the kind of things that I'm trying to say, and it kind of puts it together in one slide. And that's this notion that here is a paper. This is just one view of the knowledge. It's not the only view. I could actually generate a series of other views, but let's start with that view that's familiar. It has a lot of attraction. It has a lot of value. I actually understand it. It has an interface that I can use. 
It's not like an interface in an institutional repository, sorry, that basically is unusable. I can use this. I've used, you know, I go from one journal to another. It's pretty recognizable that it's the same thing. We shouldn't throw something like that away. But we, we probably, we need definitely different forms. Then I do what I do now. I, I click on a little thumbnail in that you know, online uh, journal article. Up pops a bigger version. And that's kind of where it stops right now. That's useful. But in this case, it doesn't really matter what this is. But just for, for reference, this is a, you know, an enzyme, uh, a structure of an enzyme. And you know, this is, there's a lot of in amazing information and author-based knowledge in the way that this is rendered and represented. But it's a static entity. What I really want to do is I want to start playing with that and understanding that better. So I want to, what, I, what I can't do now is I want to click on this and I want to retrieve the data that was used to make that figure, which is actually the raw data plus a whole series of metadata that manipulates that raw data to give exactly that image. In this particular field, there's no, there's no reason why that can't happen already because the people doing this kind of work use a very small number of programs and it's kind of all online anyway. And the data that supports this is all in, you know, in the database that I happen to represent. Once I do that, I can now do things I couldn't do before. I can render this. And then what are the things I want to do? Well, I want to start mousing over this, and I want to see how people have com what the commentary is. I want the social ne networking aspect of this uh, brought to the fore. I want to know what other people understand about this particular figure. Uh, when it's rendered in a particular way. So I might be looking at something over here. You know, there's some aspect of this that intrigues me. What have other people had to say about it? There's no way that that's going to, you know, right now, if it was a f in PLOS, for example, you can comment on a paper. But people don't do that. They don't do that because there's no reward for it. On the other hand, what's emerged, which gives me some hope, is that there's very, a very active blogosphere out there when there's something wrong with a paper, but not when there's something right with it. But we're starting to get to that point. There's now people who build reputation on their blogging. And that's, that's quite an amazing turn of events. And they, they, you know, they're, they're revered at these conferences and things. So it's, 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 we're getting to a point where it's more than just papers. And so you know, the idea that there's effective uh, commentary on here is coming. Based on that commentary, I see something interesting in it. I click on it, and then that takes me to a mashup of information. It's a particular loop in this structure which you know, I'm interested in. And I get this mashup of information of other papers, other, other data sets that relate to that. And then that drives me into another paper, and so the loop continues. So I've, what I've done is I've created a few things have changed here. I've got this seamless interaction between the data and the paper and the knowledge associated with that data, which I didn't have before. And, you know, technically, this is already quite doable. And it's starting in a, in a small way to happen. But this is where, so, you know, that, if once people see this, I think that becomes, at least in my way of thinking, more of a motivator. But it's just the sort of beginning. So here's an example of something that's actually not looking at one paper. This is something that actually was done. And it's just trolling through the literature. And what it is, is effectively pulling together. So each of these nodes in this network is, it could be any, any piece of information. But let's say it's, it's a piece of biological information. It's a gene. And these genes are in this. And if two genes exist, are mentioned in the same paper, you draw a line between them. And so you've got this co dense network over here, you've got this other network over here. In, in animation mode, this would have all sprung to life. You're getting the whole picture in one shot. But so it means that there's, you know, if the, the, the thicker the line, the more interrelationship, the more times that these two genes occur in the same paper. Well, guess what? That alone tells you something important. This network has topology. And when you overlay on that a very simple thing, namely the type of literature in which this occurs, you see you've got these two distinct networks which are connected by one gene. And it turns out that the immunology community uh, 
you know, one community is not really a, understands what the other one knows about that particular gene. And so just by doing these things in a fully automated way, you can start to learn things just by trolling the literature. This is a trivial example, but it's kind of an expression of where we're, we're probably going. Then, this then, that, that's a notion of the, the, the field of discovery informatics, which I think is just beginning. I went to one of the most exciting workshops earlier this year on discovery informatics, where there was a, a bunch of computer scientists, a bunch of domain scientists, a bunch of social scientists, some librarians, all sitting in a room figuring out how we're going to deal with this future. So, you know, what's clear is Google is incredibly useful, but it is broad and shallow. When you want to get into the nuances of, of data and you want to look into a subject deeply, you might start with a Google search, but that's not where you end up. You probably don't get to where you want to be. So, you know, and science is cross-disciplinary. So what you really want is you want, you're getting to a point where the discoveries you want to make certainly surpass an individual's tools, and you need these intelligent tools to mine and, and, and troll through all this information. And then you need to, in, you know, in, increase these connections between knowledge and data in the way that we, I just described to you. And then you need to combine, what's clear, you need to combine a whole group of different type of people to address this kind of problem. And that's the sort of what uh, discovery informatics is all about. So here's, here's a scenario which just sort of expresses this to some degree. How many people here use Evernote? A few. Okay, so Evernote's a very trivial and simple tool for keeping notes. For everything from shopping lists to, you know, major developments in the lab. We actually, and the reason it's, to my mind, it's successful over other programs which are much more sophisticated, you know, lab management programs, is that it's just because it is very simple to use and for a variety of tasks. And when you get old and brain dead like me, it just, it's, it's invaluable to recall information. And it's all in the cloud, so I can be standing here uh, on my smartphone, I forget to tell you something, I can immediately look it up in my notes uh, and tell you what I forgot to tell you, so beware, you'll be here for hours. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the point is that, you know, there's a recording mechanism. Now, if everyone's using, it doesn't matter what the tool is, but, you know, the idea is that there's certain, uh, you know, there's scan commonalities in what we do in the lab at any given time. And so that can be discovered. So if two people in the lab, you know, it gets to this issue of trying to deal with a Josh situation and bring all of this closer together. So it's the idea that, you know, you can discover sort of commonalities in what's going on in the lab just by trolling through what people wrote that day. Then what's even more important is you can take that and you can go out and you can search the web. So the dream, this isn't just a dream, and this is kind of a scenario that came out of this workshop, is the idea that those particular threads and themes that are running through the lab, you can go and search the, the semantic web, which we'll get to in a second, for that kind of information. And you can pull back, and based on you know, all sorts of criteria relating to authority and other things, you could potentially rank that information. So when you get up next morning, you're having your coffee, you can see what the rest of the world has done that relates to that, your particular interest overnight. So those, you know, this is not that far, at least at some level, from being reality. And it brings into sort of play the whole notion that has been around for a long time that hasn't gone anywhere. But technically, this kind of thing is already doable. And it's doable in the context of, you know, the, no the so-called semantic web. And this semantic web has been built. Uh, it doesn't matter how it's built. If you're not into RDF and these other things, it doesn't matter. But over here down in the bottom in pink, a whole series of resources that are biological resources. And there are connections between data elements within these resources, uh, which, you know, NCBI and the National Library of Medicine have been an example of been putting these things together for years. So there's nothing particularly new about that. But what's interesting is the semantics, if done right, carry you into completely different other domains which have some value, perhaps. 
So here's a, the trivial example I show. Over here is, uh, this is uh, media, and over here there's a, the BBC database. Well, guess what? If this semantic connection was in, all in place, I should be able to find, I maintain this protein database, I'm always looking for things to help educate students. I can immediately find what the BBC has ever shown on a particular protein structure just by virtue of these kinds of connections. So it's just, it, and in principle, the technology uh, exists to do this today. So, you know, we're getting to uh, that point, but let's, let's get real, okay? So let's now be real about what we can actually do. And this is, I'm probably going to offend people, and I apologize, and these are just my own perspectives from trying to do these things, um, is that the realities of today are, are, are a lot different than this idea of just you know, a fully functional semantic web, knowledge discovery, I get up in the morning, I have a cup of coffee, and I, my paper's already written. I mean, this is just, you know, we're a long way from that. And I'd say here are, you know, three sort of realities from my own point of view that I just sort of plucked out to think about. From my point of view, data repositories, institutional repositories, are just not working. They're not working for me. I don't use them, uh, even though I'm, you know, I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to be required to use them if UC passes this open access policy where I have to opt out rather than opting in. I have to deposit a paper into my institutional repository. I mean, I tried that the other day, and I have to tell you, the whole faculty would be in an absolute uproar. I mean, I spent 15 minutes trying to do this, and you know, I got a message that someone would get back to me in two days. When I'm publishing a hot piece of science, I'm not going to wait for an institute institutional repository for two days to tell me, you know, what's wrong with it. Um, so these kinds of things. I'll mention the high noon effect in a minute. Um, and then I think, you know, there's no question that what NCBI has been able to do uh, over the years uh, is, is an exemplar for all fields of science. So I'd say that the reason, from my point of view, why there's trouble with these repositories, uh, that build it, the idea of building it and then expecting people to use it is not has not worked very well. I mean, I think the usage of our repositories uh, is just very small. Um, the idea that they're institutionalized, of course, is a problem in itself. They shouldn't be, in, they should be global. Um, you can certainly have different pieces of information in there with different access, but overall the concept should be global. And then, you know, NCBI kind of works because, first of all, it's funded well. It has strong leadership. Uh, it has a monopoly on some of these things, uh, and it thought through the IT aspects of it a long time ago. So, you know, I think there's models in there. I mean, so what it's saying is it takes resources, strong leadership, it needs the institutional support behind the repository, I mean, really behind it, uh, to really make a difference. So what do I mean? So what, you know, what's, what else is wrong? Um, I would say there's this high noon effect. Some of you, well, quite a few of you in this room, Remember the days of the VCR, um, where you would walk, whenever in, you'd walk into someone's house, nine times out of ten, you'd look under the TV set, there was their VCR, and it was flashing 12. <laughs> That's what I call the high noon effect, because no one ever went to the, pro the trouble of trying to program it. You could set the clock, but, you know, trying to record a program was like, you know, it was too difficult. The barrier to entry was just too high. DVRs have just, you know, changed that. You just pull up the program on the screen, you click a button, it's done. So that's, you know, we need to move from the VCR era to the DVR era in respect to institutional repositories and, uh, and other kinds of tools because without that, they just ain't going to get used much. It's just not going to happen. And publishers sort of, they've at least got one end of the, the, the situation sorted out. I mentioned the no idea that a paper is fairly generic. Well, you know, but not when you go to publish a paper. When you go to submit a paper, you know, the, there's not that many, but there's a significant number of different uh, journal management systems that you have to fight through. You know, and, you know, data repositories need to create something that's more uniform. What we are seeing, of course, is this merger, and that data and journals are sort of coming together, and now there's data journals. But they, to me, are not really going to get us... Any, they're a bit closer to where we want to be, and that image of total integration. But there are, so journal publishers don't know how, how to handle this. 
that most publishers do not know how to handle significant data sets. And as a result of that, they sort of palm the problem off to some, a third party. So more publishers, including PLOS for that matter, are using resources like Dryad where the data set has to be deposited. So that's a great step forward. And it gets a DOI, so at some level it's retrievable. And then it goes off into this thing called Dryad or one of these other repositories. But, you know, it's only the beginning. There's not consistent metadata, there's not consistent uh, information about that data set. We are starting to see uh, data journals themselves where this is, this is being addressed. And, you know, there are various signs. One of the beauties of the whole open access movement is it brings forth new ways of thinking about problems and new kinds of solutions emerge. And I'll just, it's a sort of a slight sidetrack, but the idea is, you know, how does that, you know, how can you take, how can you move to a new system uh, by just being a little innovative? So here's an example that's not directly related to data, but it could, it could be applied to data. And that is the idea of what PLOS has started with respect to these topic pages. So if you look at, you know, we, we talked about Meredith and, and the notion of getting knowledge from sources like Wikipedia. The problem is most scientists don't stick stuff there because there's no reward for it. You don't get tenure for writing a Wikipedia page. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you, you essentially say, all right, let's, let's, someone's more interesting than me, obviously. Let, <laughs> let, let's solve that problem by giving the credit. So let's say, let's write this page, let's write it as a mini review. And when we do that, we actually publish it in a journal, it gets a PubMed ID, it gets, you know, it gets the credit and all the rest of it. And that becomes the copy of record. At the same time, we actually take a version of that and we put it in Wikipedia and it becomes the living version. And so, you know, the, the authors get reward and we've seeded Wikipedia. So these kinds of ideas, and there's, there's no restriction, well, there is some restriction, but not very much restriction from a copyright point of view in doing that. So it's, it, it, it sort of solves a kind of problem. It builds more knowledge into Wikipedia and people get credit for it. So I guess I'm just going to close now with a sort of final message about the, the notion of trying, even though this is a globe, open access is a global initial, you know, what can we do locally? And we've been thinking about this problem uh, and I want to just give you an example of what we're at least thinking of doing uh, in my place. So first of all, we need to try and make an institutional repository uh, that's, that's useful, common standards. It's got to be vetted by the community. The community has got to be part of the development process and fully open and searchable. And it needs to reward, uh, you know, it needs to reward the people putting in there and you need to be able to leverage the asset. That is, that is, that is to me, is the key. So what does all that mean? Let me give you a specific scenario about labs. I've already fessed up that I can't reproduce my own work. Well, okay, here's the other, you know, one of the reasons is that we talk about big data projects, but if you take just the average researcher here and you take them from all around the institution, that's going to be much bigger data than taking a few of the, of the faculty who have big data. If you want to have an impact, let's not worry so much. They'll take, the big data producers will somehow take care of themselves. Let's worry about the little data producers, the people who have DVDs and drives sitting on their shelves, thumb, you know, thumb drives that are sitting around in people's drawers. Let's try and you know, uh, do something with those people to, to create a better situation, to make their work more reproducible. So, you know, and that way we could actually comply with the data plans that we're talking about. So it's really dealing with the long tail folks. How do we deal with the long tail folks? Well, a very simple solution is just the idea of having an institutional Dropbox. How many people here use Dropbox? A lot of people, right? Because it's just a great, simple, it's a s very simple thing. The problem is I can't move particularly large files into it. But on an institutional network, I potentially could because I have more bandwidth than I have when I'm passing over the broader internet. Um, I don't, when I drag something into Dropbox, it doesn't, there is no particular access control, although I can, I can define that. 
Um, so you, you want that kind of level of access control, perhaps a little different. You might want it for individuals, you might want it for a lab, you might want it for an institution, you might want it for collaborators, you might want it for globally. So same kind of thing. And you want metadata to be, you want, as you drag, you want to actually capture a small piece of metadata that's not too annoying, but actually <laughs> means that I might be able to do something with that data set two years from now because I've captured a piece of information about it that I wouldn't have otherwise had. So all of that is just trivial stuff. That's, you know, that's just creating a Dropbox. But what could you do with that Dropbox? Uh, you've now matched, you, know, you, you, can, you can employ it and develop it within the context of the university culture. So it's a rich, it becomes a rich campus resource. So how can you use it? You can put it into the campus culture by you solve the data management problem because everyone who submits a grant the people who control the institutional Dropbox are the ones that actually effectively write your data management plan. What they get in return is when you submit that grant and it's successful, we hope, then a piece, the line item you put in for that data management plan gets immediately taken off to support the Dropbox and the other, and the other things. So you're, you're sustaining it through, uh, you know, through the funding. And then the real value of it comes, or a real value comes in, in how you begin to de develop around that corpus in ways that you can't even imagine. A simple way would be, I review institutional grants on campus, right? and I'd sit there and I'd read this grant uh, from someone else on campus for uh, some money, and I thought, God, I wish I knew that person was doing that. They're doing what I'm doing. Or they're do you know. So this kind of you know, automated discovery of people, if, if my research data was in an in a institutional Dropbox, and I allowed it to be scoured for these sorts of purposes. And I would discover that I'm working on a certain protein domain, but guess what? Someone in the medical school that I didn't even know has also been looking at this, and I know that by virtue of their data. And this occurrence has occurred in the data that they've been putting in the Dropbox several times. Therefore, it's probably important to them. Let's make a contact between those two people. I've done that automatically. That, what, is, what does that give you? It may be nothing, maybe an annoyance. It has to be done very carefully. But if it's done well, then potentially what I have is a new collaboration which will then generate additional grant money, which the deans and everyone else likes, right? Uh, so that's just one kind of, you know, and then there's, there's institutional data associated with what happens to alumni, you know, what happens to students when they become alumni, and there are a million things that can also be fed into this kind of uh, process. So that's what I, I'm sort of actually working towards uh, in my own campus. Uh, you know, and this is not, it's this trivial idea. Burp has already got something along this lines, but how they're going to mine it remains to be seen. But, you know, so it's, these things are already getting out there. And then, you know, just to finish off, what I, you know, this is what, you know, I want to be able to answer questions. Right now I can't do that, particularly I can retrieve data but I can't go to resources and answer questions quite in the way I want. So this is goes beyond the institutional repository. This is really more generally. So I'm now gone from local to global. Uh, you know, I want to know all there is to know about a unit of biological data. I can't even find it now. I can find instances of it, but I can't find all of the instances of it. And I want to do things that are, uh, that are a way that are simpler, more productive, and reproducible. So here's a couple of ideas quickly how to get there. I need to have a registry. We don't actually have a registry for data. What we have is a Google index. If, if there was a data registry, supposing I generate a data set with a whole set of data items in it, let's just continue the biological theme with genes in it. Right? So, if, and, and those are, are identifiable. Then I should be able to register the fact that I have this data set and register the fact that this gene exists in this data set in a central registry. Then all it is is essentially a name of that gene and perhaps a link to, to where, it, where it resides. But people can go and use it, and I'm required to do that by the federal funding I get. I have to, I have to make it known to the registry. And then people who come along, they see, oh, here's a gene. It's, it's referenced in these several different resources. And I go and I try them, and one of them's good, one of them's bad. I can actually comment, add a comment on that. I can star rate it. I can do other things. I can crowdsource the value of that data set in the registry by the virtue of the fact that it's in a registry. So that's essentially the idea. 
Another aspect of it is that the whole idea of how I operate on that data. What's really crazy to me is we struggle to use programs in the lab that people have developed, and then immediately we get on our smartphone, we download an app, and we start running something which we understand in 30 seconds. You know, we need more of that notion of the app model in, in science and in science, uh, scientific software. And I've gone on way too long, so I won't elaborate on what I mean by that. But it's sort of, uh, you know, I think it's, it's an intuitive direction in which to take. And I think in many cases it could be done. And the nice thing about apps is there's the app store. The app store rates, it gives credit uh, for things. You know when you look in there, if it's been downloaded, you know, a bunch of times and it's got a five-star rating, it probably is, it, you know, pretty good. Uh, what, we don't have anything like that in science. You go to a paper, you read it, oh, this paper was published in the Journal of Molecular Biology, must be a good piece of software about this. You, you get it and it's not. Because the reviewers never looked at the software. So, you know, it's, it's all meaningless. Um, all right, so in summary, whoops, uh, we have at hand, I think, the way to increase the rate of discovery. We need to put more value on the data and the individuals that produce it and the institutions that maintain it. We're all stakeholders in this uh, endeavor. And I'm just going to give you one example of how you can get involved. There is an orga organization called Force 11, which has come out of the, the common the, a group of people who feel that they can really make a difference in scholarship by getting together and working together in this notion of a commons, effectively, to improve uh, the way that scholarship is maintained and disseminated. And you know, I encourage you to take a look, sign up to the mailing list, uh, and, you know, and get involved. And here's a, just, there's actually a manifesto that came out of uh, the Force 11 work, and you can look at that. And there's also the fourth paradigm, which uh, really focuses on the importance of data all of this, these, both of these are obviously open access. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at those. And I apologize for going on a bit long. And I apologize for the fact that I couldn't show you all those wonderful animations. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm willing to be yelled down. I'm willing to be abused. I'm willing to, whatever, it's, whatever you want to do. For Dr. Bourne? Disagreements, anything. I'm Marty Courtois. I work with the um, repository here at K-State. And I had a question, <laughs> and boy, I think I'm going to need to look at my computer again. Um, do, do you think repositories would be more useful if we made them easy to use? Um, for example, in, in libraries, um, we're very good at identifying all, all the publications from faculty on campus. You know, we have the tools to identify that. So if we um, devise a system where faculty don't have to take the time, like you mentioned, to sit down and deposit an article in, in the repository, but if, we, if that would happen automatically, we know that, you know, Professor A publishes this paper, and um, it goes into the repository automatically. Would that help to make repositories more useful from, from your perspective, or are we still, you know, just... No, I mean, I think these are small steps that make a huge difference, right? So I'll give you, just taking the idea of, of putting, uh, a student putting a thesis, you know, having the thesis repository. Well, I'm sure you do too. We have specific format requirements for what that should, what, what a thesis should actually look like. Well, you know, what we probably right now, that's a PDF, embedded in a PDF, which might be difficult to get at, but technically it doesn't have to be that way. So there could be, you know, there could be a way of, you know, it could be a, a different cover sheet or whatever else that's attached to the thing that really essentially automatically provides all the metadata that's needed for that thesis as it's dragged and dropped. So when the person drags it into the repository, so they finish, they're about to go out and party, they finish their thesis, you know, they drag it into the repository, the repository says, this is a thesis, here's all the information. You say, yes, that's correct. Uh, I just want the reviewers to look at it right now and click. You, the reviewers are already there. Click, they get an email, they can go and drag it back, but no one else can look at it. Then, you know, after the partying is over and the person's passed their thesis, 
you know, it becomes a part of the public record. I mean, there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing technical to stop any of that right now, uh, as far as I can tell. It's just the resources and the will to, to make it happen. Yeah, and resources are an issue. So it's really where, you know, where does the value come? And I think what's going to happen, and perhaps I didn't say this as well as I wanted, in this knowledge economy, it's clear that more and more there's going to be a constant reminder that mining information brings forth new things that have some kind of value. It could be economic, it could be other. I mean, I was at a meeting where, uh, uh, where they brought forward two editors from two of the major British publications and uh, newspapers, Murdoch's The Times and The Guardian. And at the time, they were talking about what Murdoch did was he, when they, decide, they decided to put up a paywall, they lost 95% of all of the Times subscribers to the online version in a month. I mean, no one was going, you know, and it was obviously a bad pricing model, and all that, but, you know, there was too many other places to get news. On the other hand, the Guardian's model was, okay, we're going to make this content free, but we're going to create an API around it so people can write applications that use that content. So one group were, wrote an application where they could actually predict voting patterns just by looking at large amounts of the corpus and information that was in the corpus, the news corpus, as to what voting patterns were in particular counties in Great Britain. You know, that has value. And so, you know, and, that, and they got a piece of that action. And so you can imagine just one, you know, trite example of how that, that corpus could be used. So, you know, it's a different business model, but it's an interesting model. Be interesting, not to say these things are going to work out, but I think that the nice thing is that, you know, with, with, with openness comes uh, innovation. I mean, that was, that's the mess. There are lots of different kinds of messages like that. Uh, you know, drug companies are realizing this now that they can gain much more by making at least some of what they do open. Um, the financial industry is another one. The World Bank is essentially making huge amounts of information open access. Sorry, that was a big ramble on for that one simple no, question. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, Dr. Bourne. I'm Char Simpson. I'm the coordinator of electronic publishing here at Kansas State University Libraries. We run an open access press. Uh, but my question doesn't have to necessarily do uh, deal with the data, but uh, the UK government has, is now funding, what, 10 million dollars, uh, 10 million pounds to uh, publishers to support immediate and open access to articles published by their researchers. What do you think about the Finch report that this was based on and, and the adoption by the UK? Do you see that happening here? No. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um, I must say, I, 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 I haven't read the report. I mean, I know of it, and I've looked at people's opinions of it and discussions about it. Um, but, I mean, it, the, the somewhat of a different culture, I think. Um, but notwithstanding, you know, it's, it's a very interesting step. And I mean, I think... I have to enormous, uh, you know, thanks to the likes in this country, the likes of the NIH for taking s the stance that they have with respect to uh, open access. I mean, it's a huge step, and you know, I, I think, you know, w whether you take a very large step or you take a smaller step, a, s a step is good, and you know, it'd be interesting to see how all of that pans out. Dr. Bourne, you mentioned um, several times that in order for data to be more accessible, faculty have to be rewarded in the tenure and promotion um, process. Do you see that happening anywhere yet, or is it happening on your campus? We just had a report where we looked at uh, whether it was a, a, a group were charged with actually looking at uh, the way you know, uh, promotion was done. And I think there were, from my point of view, in my new job, it was a little disappointing because it, I don't think innovation was rewarded as much as I would have liked to have seen. Um, 
But what was clear is the idea is we have to get away from this notion of rewarding people in a singular sense. I mean, that's ultimately what we have to do. But we, we somehow we have to reward them for the fact that science itself is becoming much more collaborative. And the whole idea of you know, what has value uh, as part of that collaboration um, is, you know, needs, to be, needs to be assessed. I mean, again, I'm a, I'm a total radical, but to me, the university structure itself is totally broken. I mean, the, the fact that we have that people and money effectively are siloed into departments that don't necessarily make any sense anymore in the way that people do research. We solve that problem uh, in the UC system by organized research units which bring people together around particular uh, areas of interest, but they still get appointed through appointments, their students get graduated through those departments. Sorry, um, and, and the money flows through those departments and not necessarily into all of it going into what producing the results from it. So it's, it's kind of a step, but it's not perhaps as far as we want to go. So, you know, th there's a lot of issues at stake here. Um, but, you know, changing, changing systems like that is very hard. Um, you know, all I can say is I wrote an editorial a while back that says uh, how to get promoted as a computational biologist in academia and it was download, it got huge downloads on the PLOS site. So there are a lot of people who <laughs> are interested in, you know, and essentially the message was, as I said in the talk, you have to educate uh, the committee that's reviewing you. Because, you know, I'll be quite frank, I mean, I sit on tons of these committees. And you say you have six people making a decision. Well, really, probably two people know that person's work pretty well. One, perhaps, very well. The rest, you know, and, and, and you know, how it goes is you look at where that person's published. That if you don't know the work well enough. And now you might actually use Google Scholar or, or ISI Web of, of Science to actually see, you know, what kind of impact it's had. A lot of reviewers wouldn't. But, you know, that's as much as far as it goes. If you say I produce software or I produced, you know, these data sets, it doesn't count for anything. And yet, you know, ask yourself what's more valuable? a paper that's only been cited by the people who wrote it, or a data set that's been downloaded you know, hundreds of times and it's generated a whole lot of new papers in science. It's kind of a no-brainer to me. We had this great idea when we were discussing this at Gordon and Betty Moore, and that is that you know, the way to get attention in, in institutions is with money. So the idea was we would actually create chairs within these institutions for the kind of... I guarantee there's probably people that you know that probably don't get the credit in this institution that they should do because they do things that are not quite traditional, yet they're a, an absolutely integral and important part of the fabric of, of research and education. So the idea was to identify some of those people and give them chairs, is actually make them a named chair and to elevate them into a position of uh, where they would be recognized by their peers. And, you know, I think this is particularly true in, in, the, in, the, in the data in the digital realm because, you know, th these people underlie what's absolutely critical and some of them are doing amazing work but they're also maintaining resources for others and all this sort of thing and they don't get quite the credit they deserve. Another long-winded diatribe, sorry. Any other questions? We still have a little time. Um, before we end, I just wanted to remind you we have another program tomorrow called Open Access and Your Publications, What's Copyright Got to Do With It? It's in Hale Room 407, beginning at 1.30. Uh, this is a webinar with uh, copyright authority Kenneth Cruz, who will be talking about how you can facilitate access to your materials by learning to be proactive. So please join me again in thanking Dr. Bourne. Thank you for having me. It was yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Let me turn this off.